All right, let's focus on this, okay? Let's talk about gender, all right? There we go. Let's talk about gender. This is super fucking important to me, okay? So I want to speak, listen, point of personal privilege, okay? I want to acknowledge the fact that while my opinions on gender abolitionism are sincere and I think rooted in a pretty deep academic understanding of the subject, I have never, like, gotten shit on for my gender before, you know? You know what I mean? Like, I've never suffered or experienced any ill will on account of my gender or my gender presentation. So everything that I have to say on the subject is going to be informed almost as a necessity um, from a point of, um, uh, of at least some level of privilege. All right, let's talk. Let's talk about gender, my friendos. Okay, what the fuck is gender? All right, since time immemorial, all right, we have had, in terms of broad dimorphic social groupings, two sexes now obviously if you're a big woke boy like me the biggest wokest boy here can i do a quick gradient wait hold on what's primary to secondary color hold on wait let's do primary blue wait i'm gonna do red wait blue p pink okay wait watch this okay wait foreground to background yes there we go. All right, listen. Okay, this is, if we're going to use gender colors, I mean, we're committing, you know? This is how, shut up. This is how gender, I'm sorry, this is how sex actually is, okay? It's a, um, it is a bimodal distribution where typically speaking, people fall within a closed range of options, but there are examples of people who fall closer to the other um, end of the spectrum than they do within their own. So to give an example, for instance, people who are male are typically larger than people who are female. But as we all know, there are some people who are female who are larger than individual males. So the uh, like um, binary grouping of gender like this doesn't really work. And if you examine the scientific literature, you'll find that there's pretty much broad consensus on the idea of sex being a, um, being a continuum, like a very complex um, set of uh, uh, characteristics that we just group together for the sake of sort of social convenience. But with all that being said, okay, we have in terms of our social groupings, typically had cis men and cis women for quite a long time. And there are some characteristics that we can associate with those, okay? So we have the the dongo. How can how much can I get away with on YouTube? There we go. I can get away with that, right? And we've got goobers. And we've got big honks, okay? And we have other characteristics like uh like hairy ass armpits, which are secondary sexual characteristics that are representative in pretty much everybody, though there's some relatively hairless people. Um, I'm going to draw out some characteristics, okay, that are typically associated with sex. All right, let's do this together. It's going to be a fun game, okay? Um, all right, we're going to do, here, look, this is a dongo. I'm pretty sure I can get away with that on YouTube, okay? All right, we good with that? And I'm going to draw, this is, these are wide hips. That's a little belly button, see? Um, what are what are what are some other good ones here? Okay. Um, hmm. Let's let's think of a few good ones here. What can I get away with? Um, oh yes, um, cis uh, cis women don't poop. We know this. Okay. So those are some examples of secondary. Uh, of, of some sexual characteristics that um, are or oriented pretty much entirely around the physiology um, that people are assigned when they're born. Obviously, there are extents to which we can change this, but for the purposes of gender abolitionism, none of this is really relevant. What is relevant is the characteristics that sort of get associated with these things, okay? Like, here's a good example. Suits, okay? Here, I'm going to quickly draw a little suit, all right? Okay, look, watch. I'm going to draw very quickly. See, like so. And then we're going to do-do-do. 
See? Look, that's like a little suit. See? How the fuck do you even draw dresses? All I remember is like... Elsa's dress from Frozen. Who even wears dresses? I don't even know what the fuck I'm drawing. That's a dress, okay? And we've got that. Um, we have like earrings. See? Big hoop earrings. We have uh, long hair versus short hair. And a wide variety of other things, okay? Now, why am I drawing all these nonsense doodles? Well, the reason I'm doing this is to illustrate a critical difference in the types of things we associate with gender um, and the ways in which those characteristics manifest. So if you think, say, for example, that you're uh, like a, just a not at all woke person, okay? You don't really know the difference between sex and gender, okay? And I ask you to describe what a man is, all right? Now... This person probably doesn't know, like, shit about trans issues. Probably not. So if I ask them what a man means, they're probably going to go, like, oh, uh, a hairy chest and uh, a penis. And they wear a suit and they've got short hair. They grow a beard. And um, they're, they're, like, have a deep voice. And they're very confident and masculine. And they're the dominant sexual partner, obviously. And that sort of thing. And if you take a look at all of those characteristics, you can break them down into two separate categories. One of them, uh, penis, hairy chest, what have you, um, these are more physiological characteristics that are associated predominantly with your genetic makeup when you're born. But other things like having short hair, being um, sexually dominant, uh, being confident, um, wearing suits, uh, wearing like nice leather shoes, these things are associated predominantly with Gender. Gender refers to a set of social expectations and roles that are oriented around one's sexual presentation. Here in the West, we have two genders, or at least two socially recognized genders. We have men and women. And because we are at this moment, currently reconciling the existence of trans people with that sexual um, and gendered um, uh, binary, we, um, in this system, in the West, recognize, or at least we believe, that gender and sex are more or less oriented around each other, that gendered characteristics are naturally emergent from sexual characteristics. For example, um, men being more mechanically predisposed or men being more sexually dominant or confident or what have you, men wearing suits. But if you look back through time, you don't have to look back through a particularly long length of time at that. You can find examples where this breaks apart. Um, there is by no means any intrinsic association between men having short hair and women having long hair. Like that, that system is not in any way like genetically pre-oriented. How, how could it be? Men's hair and women's hair, the same? It's the same genetically. Um, it's just how we choose to cut it. And I could think of plenty of societies in the past that where it's been fashionable for men to have long hair and plenty of societies in the past where it's been fashionable for women to have short hair. Think about, um, what do you call them? Flappers back during the 1920s, right? They kept their hair pretty fucking short. Jesus had long hair. You love Jesus, don't you? Um, men like blue, women like pink. That only came about because a toy company back some hundred years ago ran out of, um, they ran out of uh, dye for the toys that they were making. Prior to that point, uh, pink was considered to be the predominantly masculine color. Look, see this? Look at this. It's got a pink face, a little octopus that I got at Anime Expo. Look at pink. I mean, really look at it. It's a bold color. Roman. You can think of like centurions, powerful. It pops. It's strong. It's vibrant. Blue is a more cool, sedated color, right? You kind of flip the gendered structure on its head there. Prior to that point, pink was considered masculine, blue was considered feminine. Um, we can look this up actually super quickly um, because I remember
Yeah, the um, if you look down a toy aisle right now, if you go into any store, a Toys R Us, do they even exist anymore? A Target, whatever. You can see um, like the girls' toys are like crazy fucking pink and the boys' toys are like crazy fucking blue. It's wild. It's like it's out of a cartoon. But if you go back just a little bit in the past, this association didn't exist, but people today will treat it now like it's sacrosanct. I once saw uh, an infographic on what, what, how you should like color your house, like what, how you should paint each room, you know? And it was like in the kitchen... You should paint it a light yellow because it's vibrant and it will make you hungry in the morning. And you should paint your living room a nice sage green because blah, blah, blah. And then it gets like, you should paint your son's room blue because it encourages calm confidence. And you should paint your girl's room pink because it encourages delicate. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought we were, I thought we were using facts and logic right here. Not fucking feelings. No matter how you look at it, the farther back you go, gender becomes increasingly arbitrary. Everything we associate it with, dresses versus suits, men used to wear dresses, suits haven't existed for that long, but there have been plenty of fashion trends in the past and today where women have looked plenty good in suits and been widely celebrated for their appearance. The fedora used to be considered a women's hat, now it's considered a men's hat. I'm not sure how that transition happened. Facial piercings, earrings and the shit, you really think men weren't rocking that shit ye back in the day? Um, men were wearing dresses, um, you know, there were societies in which women Women were expected to be the sexually aggressive ones. I'm pretty sure there are Greco, ancient Greece um, city-states where that was the case. All of these associations are arbitrary. And in my opinion, and this is where we get into that gender abolitionist bent, uh, and in my opinion, these associations are not only um, arbitrary, they are harmful. And this is where we get into gender like roles, gender expectations, okay? Um, to say that gender is arbitrary is not like a super hot take in most left-leaning circles. I'm not exactly expecting accolades for that one. Um, and to say that gender roles are harmful, I think, is similarly, you know, um, tepid. It's bathwater temperature a take. Um, but as an anarchist, I see value in the deconstruction of social hierarchies and taxonomies, which I believe contribute to oppression, not just to make those hierarchies good, not just to make those hierarchies uh, fine or decent or not harmful, but to destroy them. Something should have value to be kept. What do we get from gender? Like, what do we what do we actually get? from it what's the benefit can we all actually take a second to think for a second because I, I i actually want us to think about this okay what do we get from gender because i can't think of much everything that i have that is associated with my gender for example i'm confident i speak in a deep voice I'm large, you know, I'm mean, pretty big. Um, you know, I, I like strength, both, both like as a metaphysical concept and physically, I like being physically strong. I think those things benefit me in some ways in my day-to-day -day life. These things are gender associated, but I could get all of these without gender. Gender isn't really necessary to teach me the importance of these things. It doesn't help me recognize why these things are important. I've never looked at myself and thought, I should be confident and well-spoken because I'm a man. Well, no, I should be confident and well-spoken because it helps me achieve my goals. I should be strong and bold because I'm a man. Well, no, I should be strong and bold because it helps me achieve my goals. Um, I can't really think of any way in which gender helps people or the expectations surrounding gender help people because if something that gender provides us is valuable we should be able to argue for its value outside the gendered paradigm I, at least that makes sense to me right so i don't know what good gender gets us i can think of some harm 
gender ascribes to us. See, gender can't really exist outside of gender roles. Anytime you create a category for someone, the existence of the category implicitly reinforces the belief, both from with those within the category and those from without it, that people in that category should hold themselves to certain values. There's no value to a category that has no meaning, right? So what if you're a man? Well, strong, confident, sure, cool. Um, man can't cry, can't show emotion, emotionally brusque, uh, difficulty expressing their feelings, difficulty communing with, uh, communicating with and relating to others, um, taught to be aggressive, competitive, um, and almost like antisocial to an extent when it comes to their, um, to, to the, the, um, the presentation of their values and others. Um, these are some pretty like fucked up values that were associated with masculinity and there are we call them toxic masculinity you know like this is a pretty well regarded term toxic masculinity elements of masculinity which when reinforced in the mind of its constituents lead to negative outcomes men being brusque and aggressive and having difficulty sharing their feelings and fuck it there's toxic femininity too like that catty bitchy like hyper sensitivity to others like social status um that i think like gets coded pretty hard as toxic femininity um the, like pathological obsession with other people's like social lives and how to these things aren't exclusive to femininity nor are toxic masculine elements exclusive to men but if you look on like both ends of the spectrum here there are a ton of ways in which gendered expectations can reinforce harm in a person's self-perception and in just the way they engage with society this is like this is like some easy shit, right? So I ask you, why keep these categories? Like what benefit do they serve? Because as long as those categories exist, people are going to be held to expectations concerning the characteristics associated with those categories. And if there are no characteristics associated with those categories, then they don't, they don't mean anything. If you want to say, hey, girl power, but by the way, girl can mean absolutely anything. There's no right or wrong way to be a girl. Then, then why be a girl? What? Uh, okay. Like, hey, you're, I'm a, I'm a boy. By the way, boy doesn't mean shit. There's nothing, there's no right way, no wrong way to be a boy. What does being a boy even mean? I don't know, but I'm a boy. What? What? Why be, why be a boy? <laughs> Wait, why keep the category if it doesn't mean anything? What the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. Why, why do you keep categories exist? The categories are all socially constructed, all of them. They don't exist in nature. We build them through language, through social rigor to serve a purpose. And if a, if, if a category doesn't serve a purpose, but it could conceivably cause harm, why keep, why be boy? Friends, why be boy? I don't get it. So, oh, it's off center. Hold on. Why be boy? <laughs> I don't get. I don't get it. Um, wh why do it? What's the value? What's the purpose of maintaining a taxonomy that doesn't serve any social function, that serves no distinction, that doesn't reinforce any values, which doesn't reinforce any roles, which doesn't teach us anything, which doesn't give us anything? All it does really is serve for a potential of discrimination down the line. As long as there are categories, people will discriminate based on categories. That's just That seems to be a fundamental component of existence. As long as race exists, there will be racism. As long as sex exists, there will be sexism. As, and as long as gender exists, I suppose, there will be gender-based discrimination. Categories will always invite some form of discrimination. So the ones that we have, the ones that we keep, we have to choose those things. Now, I hear you asking right now, what about the transes? Okay? What about, what about the tramp people? All right? 
Gender abolitionism gets mixed up in a lot of gross-ass turf shit because turf people like to pretend they don't care about gender, and then in the next breath they'll talk about how femininity is this mystical spiritual thing endowed to you on birth if you have a vagina, and that if you have a penis you can't be a woman because you're just being a faker or something. You're a confused man. So TERFs lie when they call themselves gender abolitionists. I have never met a TERF who genuinely didn't care about gender. They pretend not to care about gender if it means they get to bludgeon trans people. That's their little, that's the little game they play right there. That is not, they fucking love gender. TERFs fucking love gender, okay? They adore it. They crave it. Tur TERFs fucking snuggle gender to bed every night. They write that shit on their little fucking, uh, on their, what do they call it? What's the Japanese name for love pillow? I don't know. They love that shit, okay? Don't listen to them. What about, what about the trans people? Okay, well, I ask you, what about the trans people? So, the reason why I want gender abolitionism is because I think people are hurt by gendered expectations. I think these categories cause measurable harm. And who do they harm more than trans people? I ask you, who suffers more than trans people when it comes to misplaced, derogatory, harmful, oppressive, pernicious expectations associated with gender? Who more? Nobody. Trans people get hurt more than anyone else. That's on, that, that's, they're getting the worst of it. So why would I prescribe any kind of gender abolitionism? Why would I support it in any way, shape, or form in a way that harms trans people, the people who are most harmed by the existence of the category I'm looking to eliminate? A lot of people, and by people I mean TERFs, who aren't really people, will say this. They'll say, Hey, there's no such thing as gender, um, and they'll, they'll say this to a trans woman, okay? Hey, there's no such thing as gender. Um, uh, uh, you're just a feminine boy. Why can't you just, like, you can wear a dress and be a boy. You don't have to, like, be a girl. You can never be a girl. Why don't you just be a feminine boy? That's, the, that's sort of like the turf line there. Um, I propose to you this, okay, as an alternative to the turf approach to gender abolitionism, a distinction that some may call problematic, but it's one that I believe genuinely exists that we should respect the existence of. The distinction between transgender and transsexual. I know the term transsexual sounds crazy fucking outdated. I recognize that, but please hear me out on this distinction because it's an important one, okay? Transgender means to identify as any gender which is not the one which you were assigned at birth. So a non-binary person is trans because they, I mean, non-binary people don't, don't identify as the gender they were assigned at birth. That makes them trans. That's definitional right there. That's easy. Um, they fit the, they, they fit the fucking, there, congrats, you're trans. Um, however, transsexual means that you are physiologically uncomfortable with the sexual characteristics associated with your body and you would like to change those. These two categories often overlap, but not always. I know there are transgender people, um, both trans women, trans men, and non-binary people, who have no interest whatsoever in changing their body. They are a they are 100% okay with how their body is, with their genitals, with their presentation, with how it would, like that shit, you know? They are they are a okay with that shit. They're fine with that. I know trans women who um who have big fucking floppy dongers and 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 like flat chest and they're they're completely fine with that. Cool. That's on that's fine. Yeah. Hell yeah. And um, that person would be transgender, but I don't think they would be transsexual. They don't seem to have any interest in altering the sexual characteristics uh, assigned with them at birth. And that's every bit as valid as the alternative. Um, and there are many transgender people who are also transsexual, who in addition to making an effort to socially present as a, a, a woman, if you were assigned male at birth or whatever, in addition to, what the fuck do trans women do? I don't know, fucking frilly ass dresses and cat girl ears, I don't know. Um, in addition to that stuff, they also want the floppy dongo punched inwards and um, to get big, big floppies up here. They get the floppy from there to there, you know? 
and their then transgender social presentation identity and transsexual to alter the sexual characteristics uh, that they were, you know, uh, sort of endowed with at birth. But I also know a few people who are transsexual but not transgender. I think this is probably like the smallest minority, but they're every bit as valid as any other. Um, I know actually my best friend um, in high school and later on, I would actually consider to be such a person um, because he is not transgender. He was assigned male at birth and goes by he, him, but he has considered taking um, HRT in the past um, just because he likes the idea of altering some of his sexual characteristics. Nothing to do with gender. He likes being he. That I would consider to be an example of being transsexual without being transgender. Um, so there's a difference between these two things right here. And in gender abolitionist world, in magical future gender abolitionism, one group would continue to exist. And one group would, by definition, no longer exist. If there's no gender as a concept, you can't be transgender. It's not possible. It can't... It, there's no gender. You can't be transgender. If you are assigned male at birth and you want to present in a different way than we might imagine one assigned male at birth might traditionally present themselves as, that's not trans anything because the category you're transcending no longer exists. However, draw it out. <laughs> okay, look, it's simple, my comrades, okay? Here's the gender box, okay? All right, the X is where you're born into, where you're assigned, and the and the O is where you want to be, okay? So if we're going to... There you go, okay? So if you're assigned here, and you want to present here, congratulations, you've done it, you're transgender, okay? But that doesn't work anymore in a society where the boxes don't exist. You're just... There, there's no X. You're not assigned anything. There's no O. You just There's just the O. You're just born in this ephemeral space of abstraction where there's no expectation, no associations. When you're born in a gender-abolished society, there's no expectation for how you'll dress, how you'll act, how you'll talk, how you'll behave. Nothing but the absolute baseline physiological expectations that one might associate with a person who's born in the way in which you're born. For example, like uh, here you have a penis, maybe you can pee standing. Like, I, like the very baseline shit, you know? Everyone can pee sitting. But there is no expectations whatsoever when it comes to how you would present yourself, how you would identify, how you would decide to orient yourself sexually, how you would interact with other people. Um, but there would still be transsexual people. It is still entirely conceivable in a gender abolished society that a um, that that a person could be born with like big floppy boobies and well hopefully hopefully they wouldn't be born with that actually um, that'd be a little bit strange but shortly after being born they would have the big floppy boobies but they don't want to have big floppy boobies they want to have a flat booby want flat boob no booby zero booby. Um, that's not a gender decision. That's a sexual decision. And those people would be transsexual. If, if we recognize the existence of this distinction, the transgender transsexual distinction, I think it's perfectly reasonable to under like the understanding that gender abolitionism doesn't have to come at the expense of trans people. If anything, trans people are the ones who would be most thoroughly liberated by this because trans people above all others experience the suffering associated with jumping between those boxes with the removal of the boxes every single person has to free of social pressures free of oppression free of coercion make the personal decision 
to go out there and live their life authentically, presenting, dressing, speaking, engaging in the ways they feel most comfortable. All of them, every single one of them. And some people who have gender, or I guess in this case it would be sexual dysphoria, would want to get their floppies dongoed or dongoed floppies. And that's fine, and they can do that. This, to me, seems like the best way, the most humane, reasonable way to address the harm done through gender without losing any good, any social utility. What do we lose? Who's harmed by what I propose? I, I don't... I don't think anybody. Um, I've heard a bunch of different terms um, thrown around for this. Gender abolitionism, gender nihilism, gender anarchy. Um, some terms seem to be more predominantly associated with TERF, some not. I don't know. I don't care. Words are dumb, just like gender. What I know is this. In my opinion, the world would be a better place if we slowly made steps towards drinking a fuck ton of water If we made steps towards delegitimizing gender as a construct, if we made steps towards making it less important, think of how important gender was back just 70 years ago in the 1950s. Have you ever seen advertisements from that era? The man-woman divide in America was like this, it was like this, this existential, it was like a divine rift between the two, and all of society was oriented around the social distinctions between these two groups. It's fucking wild if you go back. It's crazy. And nowadays, we've gotten a lot better about this. Men and women more integrated, so on and so forth. But it's not far enough. Why don't we keep pushing that envelope? Why don't we keep pushing that place until we recognize, hey, well, we've made this recognition now. Hey, you can be a man and be wispy and effeminate. Hey, you can be a woman and be brusque and masculine. We keep pushing and pushing and pushing until man doesn't mean anything and woman doesn't mean anything. And we're left with two categories that mean nothing, that have no distinctions, that serve no value. And then we slowly recognize that they we don't need them anymore. This will be a really long-term process. This is not like something that we can do in a year or a decade or even a century, but it's a long-term goal that I believe in very sincerely because I don't like unnecessary social constructs. I don't like race either. I'm also a race abolitionist. I don't want fucking race to exist. Fuck that. Hey, this person has dark skin, light skin. Sure. Hey, this person's black or white with all the shit that gets associated with that. Nah, fuck that. We didn't used to have race the way we have it today. We didn't used to have gender the way we have it today. These things can be changed, molded. They're not intrinsic. We can fix this. We can do better than how we're currently doing. And that's a way in which I want to do better. Ali Akais asks, Vosh, what about the colonized societies that have multiple concepts of gender deeply tied with their cultures outside the Western binary? Asking because I come from a culture where extra gender options exist. I've done some research into other societies in which there are varying, uh, like different, like outside the Western binary of gender. And while I recognize the validity sort of in a socio-cultural historical sense of these identities, i I still think they're oppressive. Um, I'm not suggesting that we pa like patronizingly go and recolonialize these societies to destroy their understanding of gender. Just that collectively, as our world grow glo grows more globalized, more modernized, these are steps we should take towards gender abolitionism, liberation, whatever the fuck you like to call it. You know, um, fuck me, I'm behind on chat. How does this idea recon with scholarly accounts of gender like Judith Butler's, which describe it as a complex relationship between the individual and their society? Oh, it squares perfectly with that. Judith Butler argued that gender is a performative act, that gender is a is a, a set of performances that we demonstrate. So when I talk to you in this deep voice, when I do these hand gestures, when I 
crack my knuckles emphatically. I'm performing masculinity at you. Whereas it's perfectly reasonable that somebody with my exact same body could act just like this. And if you gave it a couple of days or maybe weeks to get used to it, it's, <laughs> it's completely possible this could seem every bit as normal to you as my the way in which I normally present. But I don't act that way because I present my masculinity. But I don't think that's in any way, shape, or form contrary to how gender abolitionism works. We present this way because we're told to present this way. The performance only is the performance is only possible because we're on a stage. If you destroy the stage, the performance ends. No, Judith Butler is not a gender abolitionist. GF making me some rice. <laughs> How would sexuality work in a gender abolished world? Instead of being hetero, would you be femme attracted? I think that would probably be the closest way we can envision it now. We're, we're, when we think of a gender abolished world, we think of a world that is radically different from our own. So much of our world is tied into gender. Um, it's difficult for me to understand how sexuality or, or preferences might orient themselves. But in my mind, like, I don't really think people are attracted to gender, right? Like it's not really gender, it's presentation, it's, 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 uh, it's appearance, it's, there's a whole variety of characteristics. Um, I don't really know, like, like imagine like we encounter an alien race that looks exactly like ours, that has similar social standards, but they have no understanding of gender. They look exactly like us and you meet someone who looks pretty much like your type, but they have no understanding of gender. They just go by like they in our language. Like, would you be like, oh no, sorry, I'm only into girls or oh no, sorry, I'm only into boys. Probably not. And given how much, um, uh, uh, how much interest there's been like historically in, in, in alien creatures as a concept who fit within our standards of beauty. I don't really think gender is how we're attracted to people. And how could it be? Gender didn't exist back when our Neanderthals were fucking one another. Back when our fucking Neanderthal ancestors were clubbing each other over the head to get that like fucking hairy ape dick. Like, there wasn't gender back then. That shit didn't exist. And they were still fucking around. Gender isn't how we orient attraction. Gender is how we describe a set of characteristics, which may or may not be correlative, that sort of correspond to how we are attracted to people. I'll give you an example. Think of how many people, how many men who consider themselves straight are attracted to femboys and the the traps thing. Now, of course, trap is a slur, blah, blah, blah. But that's the name of the sort of the phenomena that we're seeing. Think of how much... Like, this is blown up. There are literally, like, millions of dudes that are, like, straight identified but are into that. And why wouldn't they be? Because those femboys are trapped or whatever they like to call them. They're boys, yes, but they're very feminine. And because they're feminine, they align with the 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 sexual interests of the people who are... Um, uh, uh, interest in that kind of pornography and those kinds of people. It's not a gender thing. It's a presentation thing. It's not your chromosomes. It's how you look and how you act. I think this is how people define their attractions, really. Um, and there are exceptions to this, uh, certainly. I know there are some people who are, and I, who are literally like, they'll look, uh, like I'll point at a dude and they'll be like, no, I'm not into that. And then I'll point at the exact same dude and I'll say, actually, this is a pre-everything trans woman. And they look like me. And then they'll be attracted to them. So I know some people have associations with attraction that orient around gender specifically. But I think that has more to do with their baggage than it does with any intrinsic association with how sexuality and attraction works. Does that make sense? I under I'm trying to convey a lot of concepts here. And I'm trying to do it very quickly. And I understand that... Um, that uh, I, I didn't like write it all out beforehand. But in my mind, gender abolitionism is a coherent philosophy of anti-hierarchical -hierar thought, which is perfectly in line with our modern understanding of gender theory, perfectly in line with the desire to liberate and validate the existence of trans people, perfectly in line with the desire to reduce harm in society. That is... That is how I think of it. And it's a process, you know? I am very much a man um, in every in every socially accepted sense, obviously. I don't know what my chromosomes are. I can 
reasonably guess XY. I don't really know. I've never gotten it tested. I know my test levels are pretty fucking high. Um, I've got that and I present masculine in pretty much every conceivable way. Um, I don't really mind if people called me like they, them, or she, her. It would be like weird, I guess, but I, I wouldn't really mind. But most of the reasons why I um, go along with like the he, him, like masculine bent is for the sake of convenience because it's easier for me to go by he, him because I don't care. It, like, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, and I would hope that with time, that attitude would grow more prevalent. Uh, my girlfriend, Hyena, another perfect example of someone who doesn't really care about gender. That best friend of mine from high school, the one who I said identified as a man but would nonetheless like to take HRT, I'd also consider them to be someone who doesn't really care about gender. Um, and I think that's valuable. I think that's, I think that's sick as shit. I think that's dank nasty. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, that's my perspective on gender abolitionism. So to reiterate, it is a destruction of the category of gender in a way which does not invalidate the existence of trans people, does not deny them any rights or privileges, and if anything, liberates them from, um, from coercive expectations that may lead to further dysphoria down the line. Uh, it leads to greater societal harm reduction in the long term. And I think, most importantly, it sticks it to the TERFs by showing them that TERF theory is garbage, my theory is better.